Okay. Thank you very much, Yushu. It's always useful to, to look, as, as we have done in this session, at uh, what, what we think standards should look like. Uh, Clive, you could come sit on the sofa. Um, but um, I do wonder, and I would like Clive to, to respond on this point. Um, we've heard a lot of, uh, uh, today about, about different, different rules and different procedures that, that we could use to, to try and standardise and regulate electronic cigarettes. But I guess, Clive, my question to you is, is there a risk that we throw the baby out with the bathwater here in, in, in terms of tobacco harm <laughs> reduction? Uh, yes. Um, okay, so <laughs> there definitely is a risk of that, Peter. Um, uh, first of all, thank you for the presentations. I thought they were, they were very uh, interesting. Uh, I found that a very helpful update. Um, four observations on this that are related to the baby and bathwater um, theme. Um, the first thing I felt, I've been feeling this for some first observation really, is how seamless is this all going to be? Um, you know, we had the discussion about the refill mechanism, well we know the Commission has a working group working on that. Um, you're talking about bringing it into SEN. How's that actually going to play out? Um, are there, you know, are there existing off-the-shelf standards that we could make more use of? There was a discussion about uh, child-resistant, temp, temp, child resist why, why are we not just using the ISO standard for that? And then that's done. That's, that's a, a sort of, or is it in some way inadequate? Or what about electrical safety? Can we not learn from the, the mobile phone world where you know, thousands of hours of meetings have been held on mobile phone charges? Must be able to gain from that. Second thing that sort of troubled me in the baby and bathwater um, arena, Peter, is, is all of this proportionate. Um, is there a danger that we're going to invest a lot of uh, time and money, m money in terms of actually designing the standards, but money in terms of complying with them in managing trivial risks down to super trivial levels. So what, what is, how strong is the sort of de minimis culture in this? And you, you referred to that, Catherine, I thought quite well, that there has to be meaningful toxicological risk here before it's an intervention. Otherwise, you start to, these things start to become a, a, a barrier to innovation, they, they start to have uh, harmful unintended consequences. Um, and I also thought in terms of proportionality, you've got to really think about cost, obviously, but also with the GMP thing, what, what about the time to adjust? You know, time is a great soothing balm on some of these things. Things that are not achievable in 2017 might be achievable in 2022. If you allow a glide path, it's probably probably thinking that's a ridiculously <laughs> optimistic time scale for getting these agreed. But is there, can time be used to go for something, you know, if you like, stronger, more progressive, but without <coughs> causing a lot of damage to the supply chain in the course of doing it? Um, third area, I thought, is that these, these products do not uh, exist in isolation. They are embedded in a system of nicotine products, actually a system of consumption. So are, we, are these... Do these end up being discriminatory when you consider that these products are competing against cigarettes? How do they fit in the world of heat not burn products where you can apply these standards, it would take an e-cigarette off the market, but it would be unattainable for a heat not burn product. So how, how will this work in a market that doesn't just comprise of e-cigarettes without distorting competition and favouring potentially more harmful products? And then finally, um, and you, you know, I, this is my mantra on this, is that I think anybody proposing standards has to, absolutely has to, be mindful of unintended consequences. What will this do to product appeal? What will this do to the diversity of products uh, on the market? What will this, which, you know, which is an important aspect of this market, what will this do to competition? Will it essentially establish an oligopoly of compliant capable companies but wipe out everybody else and then you know finally what effect will it have on innovation you know it's, it's very very easy for standards to become a barrier to innovation you know some of those some of those things are you know very much in that category and some of the things that we've seen on the market that are proving very successful would not actually have occurred if the TPD had already been in place anyone like to 
Okay, I think that we have uh, many uh, issues on the on the field. I I would like to to try to answer to uh, first of all the, the European uh, what is the European Commission? You said that are we all, yeah. Yeah. online? Are we are we doing? Uh, because you mentioned the fact that they're working on on the refill mechanism. They have a working group. Yeah. So uh, the European Commission, uh, we had uh, as uh, as uh, Sen, uh, we had uh, uh, a great kind of meeting with them. Uh, we uh, we have explained it, what uh, uh, what the standardization can offer. We have explained what is our platform, how things. Uh, how our standards uh, can be established. Uh, we have in our, uh, they have agreed to participate to our technical standard. I don't know if they will be there on the 22nd of June. I know for sure that the head of unit is interested in our work and is also nominate some person. So it means that uh, they are interested, they are aware of what we are doing and there is even the possibility that we they will issue a formal standardization request on e cigarettes. Uh, it was, uh, uh, there is a reference of my presentation, I, I was very fast on that slide. When I, when I mentioned the TPD and the Article 20, so there is a reference to technical standards, and then uh, we have uh, an annual work program for European standardization that is issued by European Commission and where we have a kind of wish list of topics that the Commission uh, could ask us to develop. So e-cigarette is, uh, is there. So uh, from, from this point of view we are, uh, I would say that we are aligned with them. For what regards, you mentioned the fact that why don't we see what uh, uh, ISO is doing. For the e-cigarettes, as far as I know, there is nothing on this field. Uh, we in in our uh, in the process for standardization, uh, the first uh, uh, the first uh, uh, information that uh, the CNTC is going to collect from stakeholder is what do you have at the national level or what do you know that it exists at international level. So it seems that all what uh, can be useful also to avoid duplication will be used. So of course. For instance, when, I'm, when I uh, mentioned the fact that uh, we can produce standards uh, in, a, in, a, in a short time, uh, it is based on consensus, but it's also based on the technical reference documents that are already available. So, of course, there is a, a survey to, to, to address this. So, standards and innovation. So, I work in the innovation department on uh, Ovals and Senelec. It depends on, on, on how do you build standards, because uh, if you build standards in terms of uh, minimum safety level, then you have a room for innovation, you can innovate. So you, you can establish the minimum set of uh, safety uh, rules. Uh, if you, if you um, uh, build standards, that uh, uh, specifies um, too much, go too much in the details that um, are descriptive standards, then uh, there is a risk actually that uh, innovation can be harmed and uh, uh, can be what is standardized for outcomes. Yes, I, 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 I this is our view. Sorry, I don't want to cut you off, but I would like to get the audience involved at this point because I'm sure there are plenty of you sitting there um, with various different questions that you might like to ask. Yes, I'm looking at you, Ian. Um, so if people could put their hands up, um, I'll take three at a time. Um, so I saw Ricardo. Um, there's a question over here as well. Yes, Catherine. In regards to toxicology, the route of administration is hugely important. For example, Propylene glycol glycerin are used as humectants on cosmetics. But inhaled, I don't believe there's very much toxicological information in regards to the inhalation of these substances, much less the flavors. The other consideration is you're also heating these things, which can cause chemical reactions. 
how would you propose doing toxicological studies in order to assess the uh, toxicology of e, e, uh, e cigarette juice? So, could you just, just say who you are? Oh, I'm John McCarty, uh, president of uh, InterTab Labs, and we have a product which is uh, sublingual uh, nicotine product. Um, uh, we'll, so we'll take that in a second. Ricardo, I believe you also had a question. Could you just pass the microphone a couple of chairs down? Uh, this is again uh, Ricardo Colosa, University of Catania, Italy. This is again a question to Kathleen. In regard to the products that are not uh, specifically regulated at the TBD, and I'm referring to the non nicotine containing liquids, let's think of an intended consequences again. <coughs> There are at least 5 to 10 percent people not buying nicotine containing products, and uh, another 10 to 15 percent of people they are getawaying out of nicotine use. Consider the limitation of TBD, you know, refill bottle, uh, tank size. Why not keep these out of TBD so that it's going to be a price, also in terms of, of, of costs for people who wanting to study use non-nicotinized products and trying to exit in nicotine use. Also for taxation purposes, this will be terribly important. So we really need, okay, it's a voluntary standard, so in terms of exposure to, to glycol and uh, all, all these things will be assessed anyway. But I, I really think that we need to keep this aside. Uh, let's consider it's a voluntary standard, but let's not bring everything under the same framework of TBD because this will be terribly, terribly dangerous. And if you could just pass that to Lou, who had one final question. It's Lou Ritter, American E-Liquid Manufacturing Standards Association, our aim. So my question is for Mr. Yushu, um, or more of a, something to consider rather than, than a question. Um, many e-liquid manufacturers around the world uh, are of much smaller scale. And it appeared that your presentation was focused on, on really very, very large massive quantity kind of industrial production uh, and as you go forward with the China, China standards I would encourage you to consider um, some, organi some, some recommendations towards the smaller uh, uh, in industry manufacturers as well. In the United States we have estimates of maybe 6,000 e-liquid manufacturers um, so it's just something I would encourage you to consider. I, I got the impression that you were very focused on, on very large industrial scale production and uh, I think globally we're seeing that that's the, the exception rather than the rule. Okay, we'll come back for a second round of questions in a moment, but I think we should probably just, just address those three first. We've, uh, we, we're looking at toxicology and how do, we, how do we intend to do those studies given the various different complications that arise um, in the, uh, the design and the operation of an e-cigarette. We're looking at you know, what, what sort of a framework should we, should we consider given pending legislation and what that does and doesn't cover and we're looking at it, how can we accommodate the fact that there are small artisan producers that are very popular in the marketplace and you, you could argue should, um, should that their particular position should be considered in the wider debate of standards. So two of those questions were for Catherine. So Catherine, I, I guess maybe you should go first and then just pass the microphone on to you to address the point on small manufacturers. Thank you. Okay, um, as far as the toxicological testing is concerned, uh, we're working with um, Bibra, Shelstrophical Consultancy, based over here. Um, and we're already working on uh, getting some uh, toxicological health risk assessments done for some of the flavouring compounds that we've identified. Um, there is some literature on propylene glycol for inhalation, but I agree, it's not robust enough yet. We need more. Um, what we're trying to achieve here is to keep it proportionate. Uh, make sure that it is achievable for those smaller vendors because that is the vast majority of this sector at the moment at least. Um, but we need to take into account not only thermal degradation because as you say it's heated but also leachables, extractables that might occur either in the tank during use from the device to the liquid etc etc. It's a very complex area but what the toxicologists have been able to do thus far is to look at um, literature that is available and where there is a gap in the literature, as it were, they have the experience and the knowledge to be able to do some read across sometimes, and as long as they can scientifically justify that, that's acceptable. Um, but certainly more research is needed into looking at specific toxicity effects um, of particular compounds. Um, 
one of the key areas that we were able to, to advance with this was because we started back in 2010 doing e-liquid testing and an analysing e-liquids, we've got a huge database already of identified compounds that we have found over the years in e-liquids. So that has given us the starting point, which is what they started with. So it's like, okay, imagine if you had an e a hypothetical e-liquid that contained every compound that we've already discovered in e-liquids. If all of those were interacting with each other, as well as the heating issue, and factor it all in, so you get a kind of worst-case scenario example, if you like. If you then do a top test, health risk assessment on that, if that hypothetical product is not going to cause a huge amount of concern, then there's probably not an issue. But if it is, then obviously we need to investigate that more and, and plug in perhaps more data into some of those gaps. But I agree with your point on protein glycol completely. Ricardo, as far as the uh, non-nicotine containing goes, it's out of TPD, thank goodness. If only the rest of it were also out of TPD. Um, but you know, I'm not suggesting for one moment that the TPD should cover E6 at all, frankly. Um, and it certainly shouldn't meddle with non-nic uh, either. But when it comes to policy decisions on these products, I do think actually that we do need proper regulation that does recognise that these are all vaping products, whether or not there's nicotine. Because actually the nicotine is not the most important element here. There's an awful lot else going on, and of course they are all for inhalation, so whether or not there's nicotine, it matters that they are of the right quality and safe. Yeah, um, thank you for your uh, question and a very kind to remind and suggestion. Because we come to the market with our own strategy, so um, our, our own strategy support, uh, we can produce uh, this in an uh, industrial basis. Actually, you see our workshop, actually uh, the batch is not that not large. So we, we're also able to make uh, as small as like one kilogram of batches. So that's also very flexible to our customers. But the thing is, we, we, we think, you know, uh, I, I my personally I call this like an ESEC uh, version uh, 2.0. Is coming. So because uh, the TPD and the FDA uh, deeming regulation, they, they really force the uh, the market player have to upgrade themselves, you know, to meet the minimum uh, regulatory uh, standards. So then uh, we think, you know, um, uh, this kind of uh, direction and uh, trend will encourage us, you know, provide more higher uh, quality products with a competitive cost, you know, to supply to balance you know, the industry and the uh, consumer uh, for, for use of the products. Yeah, but it's, it's very kind of to give me this uh, suggestion. Thank you. OK, so um, we'll, we'll go for another round of questions. Um, I see Ian waiting patiently with his hand up. I see Jack, I see another gentleman over there. So if the microphone could sort of find its way over here. Um, OK, so if you could just, just state your name and where you're from before you ask the question. Sure, I'm Jack Henningfield with Penny Associates and Johns Hopkins Medical School. And my question and comment concerns timing. And timing is really urgent on this issue. Every single month, month that goes by, the public becomes more frightened. They hear about formaldehyde and heavy metals. I like Clyde Bates' glide uh, path concept. And the way I interpret that is that we should do now very quickly what is possible and reasonable. And at the same time, we look down the road and what is possible in five, six, seven, eight years from now. But we can't wait several years when we can do reasonable things quickly. And in both of the uh, first two presentations, I'd love a comment on your idea of the timing. In my own comments later, I'll, I'll make some comments on this. But I'd love, what, what is your sense of the timing? How quickly can we reassure the public that something is being done to provide some basis for their confidence. This public health matters here. Uh, if you just pass it two places to your right. Michael from the Danish Trade Organization. I got a question for Sam. How, um, how fast do you think this uh, standard could be finished? Because in Denmark, they say like one year, it'll be done. I don't think you can manage that in a year. Okay, two questions on, on timing, and then seeing that we're talking about toxicology, let's have a toxicologist in. Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask you a different question, actually, actually on the timing. Very quick, my question on timing again. One case, the clock's ticking to the two. Assuming the legal challenge doesn't succeed, 
essentially you May next year uh, transition deadline. If you want to launch your product in June next year, you've got to be notified in December this year. So the you know the, the time's running out. So I had the same question: How long? Uh, toxicology. Um, someone speak to me in a coffee break if you want. That's a huge topic. I'm more interested in product stewardship. Um, you know, as I've spoken before in previous meetings. If you've got good product stewardship, the transition to standards um, is not that onerous. I'd argue. Okay, so essentially three questions on timing. Um, <laughs> so I, I, I guess, uh, Alberto, would you like to take this first and then, then maybe we'll just pass the microphone around a bit? Yes, for timing publication is one of the key issues for, for us. We have, uh, uh, since uh, 1st January 2015, we have uh, shrunk uh, some uh, deadline now in our process. Now the public inquiry is no more than five months, it's three months. And the weekend, if there is a, a consensus on the, on the standard, we can even skip the formal vote. The formal vote at the end of the process could last a few months. So maybe we can save five months. Plus we have the translation type, so we can even save, like, uh, let's say, about five and seven months with the current procedure. The point is that uh, uh, are the stakeholders uh, able to reach consensus in the, on the SNPC? Because we have already two specification, one from uh, BSI, BSI best, please the next weeks, and one from the national, from the Afro, the French body. So they are on the floor. Are they good for the all the European stakeholders? If they are, with the reference document, uh, works could really go fast. And uh, I remember that. Uh, in the, in the discussion when uh, it was approved, the, uh, the, the seventy c four three seven, uh, there was also the uh, date of mid two thousand sixteen as uh, as uh, the, the, the let's say the expected uh, date uh, for or it's hoped date for the publication of standards. So it depends on the consensus. It depends on if, if uh, everybody can agree on the how useful are the technical documents already available in this moment. So maybe one year, maybe one year is possible. It depends on you also. If, uh, if you participate, please contribute actively and uh, try to, to find consensus. Um. Uh, just uh, to reiterate uh, Jack's point, I mean, I think he's absolutely right. And, you know, one of the problems of the approach that we've had to regulation is trying to do sort of everything in one go, which means that sort of nothing much gets done to start with. And, and to me, it's, it's ridiculous. We could have had, since 2010, we could have had mandatory pharma grade nicotine, we could have had mandatory, um, you know, compliance with, uh, you know, tamper proof. Uh, child resistant standards for containers and all, you know, we could have had safe electrical chargers and these things, there, there must be a way to do these things, you know, whether it's commission decisions or, or whatever, which are, you know, interpretations of the uh, General Product Safety Directive or there must be the equivalent in the United States. What we have is trying to do sort of everything in one blunderbuss go with the Tobacco Products Directive or the deeming regulations in the States and that means that the simple things are not being done quickly. And I think a more nimble, and you know, to some extent, industry self-discipline has come in and dealt with a lot of these things as you know, kind of responsible producers, and that's a good thing. But the consumer should be assured that those things are mandatory, and that actually there's no products on the market that. And I think that could have been done. It's just that we've had the destruction of these rather grand schemes for regulating these products, which is meant we haven't done the simple things quickly. So there's lessons for that. Well, across the board in regulation. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up again on, on Jack's point as well, hello, um, about the, the, what we can do now quickly. Um, I mean, as far as reassuring the public goes, that largely depends on the media starting to tell the truth instead of making up all sorts of scaremongering nonsense. That's what the media... Um, uh, but, it, well, yes, it's fed in, and that's what I was getting to, it's fed in from elsewhere. Um, we are seeing a significant shift in the public health academic environment where people are recognising now that there is actually good evidence that of the profile and, and the safety profile of these products. So hopefully that will begin to improve. But as far as what the standards can ask of reasonably now, 
we have sought with the, with the powers, and we will seek to fight at the same level to ensure that it's proportionate to what the smaller businesses in the sector can achieve and what can be sensibly expected of them. Because that is the only thing that we can sensibly do at this stage until the industry has had the chance to mature longer. This is such a new technology and such a nascent industry. And if they don't have time to develop with the innovation still not being stifled, then it would be insane. So certainly from the past point of view, we focused on outcomes rather than dictating how you must achieve X, Y, and Z. We've, we've tried to leave it as flexible as we can. Um, are there any further questions from the floor? There is a gentleman up the front here who's yet to speak. Um, there's another question up the over there, so you can just say your name. My name is Norbert Schmidt, uh, known as Silatron. Uh, I'm a Ray Vapor from Germany for the EGED. And I got a question to Mr. Simeone. Uh, we, we all know that uh, these formaldehyde scares uh, were based on uh, inappropriate use of uh, equipment and tests uh, that uh, led to no sensible results. And uh, I was wondering if these tests are also in uh, are the testing equipment, sensible testing equipment is also in the scope of the uh, norming process uh, of the standardization process. Okay, there's one further question uh, here. Yeah. Uh, John McCarty, Intertab Labs. Uh, Isha, you talked about CMGP manufacturing of the liquid. What about the CGMP manufacturing of the device itself? As you probably are well aware, um, inhalation devices are probably the most regulated and most difficult to get through the regulatory hurdles, even more so than injectable devices. How do you propose uh, approaching the CGMP manufacturing of the device? and meeting all the testing and quality standards of an inhalation device. Okay, so there's no further hands up in this. Yes, we do, Maurice, at the back there. It's Maurice Smith from PMI. Just on the TOX question, I mean, there is data on, uh, inhalation data on, on propylene glycol, a number of studies out there, but and more will certainly follow. But for me, the question is, what's the comparator here? Are we talking about absolute safety? Of, of your cigarettes, or are we comparing them against conventional cigarettes? If you run the study comparing propylene glycol and e-juice against against a conventional cigarette and a rat, you, you'll soon see the difference, and I think it's the same point that we'll see for humans as well. Okay, so um, talking about test equipment, this will be the last round of questions. If, if you could answer it in the next six minutes, because our audience is looking very undercaminated. Um, so we're talking about uh, appropriate testing equipment, standards for uh, measuring, so for collecting and measuring vapour, um, potential for CGMP manufacturing of devices in addition to, to e-liquid, um, and uh, which, what should the comparator be? Are we, are we comparing this with cigarettes or are we comparing this with nothing? Are we comparing this with perfection or are we comparing this with the opposite of perfection? So I think the, it actually might be better to address the vaping uh, machine question so to Catherine um, in this instance and then we'll go to Yushu and then um, whoever wants to chip in on the, on the cigarette question. Okay, I actually want to jump in on, on Morris's question first, if you don't mind, awfully, um, because I know from the discussions <coughs> that we've had with our, with our colleagues at Vibra that uh, there are um, workplace exposure levels that they can refer to. There are obviously the comparators with um, effects of smoke as a comparator. Um, ultimately, what we're looking for here is straight across the board, you know, health risk assessment. What is, you know, compared with nothing. That's the baseline. But we found it helpful to bring into the standards, and I'm, as far as I'm aware, I think the, uh, the AFNAR standard also um, touches on this, that the fact that you can use benchmarks that already exist. So you can use workplace exposure limits and so on and comparators with smoking as comparators that might be useful 
to help interpret the data and so on. So hopefully that will help with that. As far as testing equipment goes, yes, uh, we both, I believe, in, in FLR and in, certainly in BSI, we have um, looked at uh, validated methods. We've also got unvalidated methods, which we're now seeking to validate. Our test bed atomizer that we developed, um, which you may have seen on our, we, we put the design out there, that's with labs at the moment being validated, and we hope that that will be validated in time to bring it into the same process. Um, but in the absence of that, as it, again, as I was saying before, we've left it quite flexible so that how you get there is up to you as long as you can demonstrate that you're able to show by whatever your test method is that the, you're able to show that there is no contamination, that the levels of whatever matters are at the right levels and so on. So hopefully that helps with that. You should look like this Thank you for your question. Actually, this gave me opportunity to say uh, what I want to say. <laughs> because you know, uh, because we are just uh, the uh, e-liquid manufacturer, so I'm not really being prepared to talk about uh, uh, e-liquid beyond that. But you know, when we uh, sell the e-liquid, actually, I know we are not really selling the liquid, but the aerosol. You know, end of the day, when you inhale it to your uh, your lung, the body that is the aerosol is not the liquid itself. So that's. A, from liquid to aerosol, that is device. So then, um, how we're going to uh, deal with the device under this GMP? Actually, in the pharma industry, it's not something new, because if you look at a lot of uh, uh, medical device, so that also produce, manufacture under uh, CGMP, so that also can follow this kind of uh, guidelines, so we can do that. That's why in our organization, we also, you know, ability to do all the, any, any kind of analysis or data, uh, for the uh, device together with the uh, e-liquid, so that's why. Um, but this is very important. Um, I think the point about the device is uh, device standards for inhalation being extremely exacting is a, a, a fascinating example of the potential for unintended consequences, because an attempt to have very very strict standards could simply remove many of the existing devices from the market. And then we have to go back to the idea that's raised by Morris and others that these products are embedded in a system of consumption of very harmful uh, products, cigarettes. So the, the danger is in enforcing a standard like that in the name of health and safety, you actually make the total health impact worse because you end up with more people not using the more effective large scale tanks or whatever, um, not switching from smoking to vaping. And therefore, you've, your regulation has had a, a series of knock-on effects in that system of consumption that actually cause more ill health. Then you have to say, well, let's say that that's a plausible theory that that would that would a plausible hypothesis that that would happen. How should you deal with that as a regulator? Should you just carry on regardless and say, well, you know, it may have it may have unintended consequences and people may be harmed if they don't switch to these products. But my job is to make a safe product. Or should you be concerned about the behaviour of the whole system? In which case you would take some care not to impose standards that remove from the market products that people were finding effective as alternatives to smoking. And that's what I think makes this a particularly intriguing standards challenge. It's not the case that more is better, uh, but tougher is better, always. You could end up with un unintended consequences that are harmful far beyond the risks that you're attempting to mitigate. That's not to say you should have no standards, but that's, you know, a clear and present danger. And believe it or not, we are now back running on time. Um, it is 11.35. Um, fantastic job for all of our speakers, both in, in the, great, the, the great word that they said and, and making sure that we're now running on time again. Um, those of you who require coffee have 10 minutes to do so. Please be back in here at 11.45 so we can start the second session. Um, and if you're not back by 11.45, we will start without you. So thank you very much. <laughs>